This podcast is brought to you by Reimagine Radio. Stay tuned to connect together for more content from the Disability Foundation. My name's Graham Wyman, and I'm the program coordinator with the Vancouver Adapted Music Society. Today joining me is Dave Symington and Sam Sullivan, the co-founders of the organization. So, gentlemen, how are you doing this? How are you doing today? Doing really good, thanks. Sounds thanks great. for having us. Yeah, yeah, doing well. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for joining me. So, I guess the first and most important question is, how did the two of you meet? Well, that's a matter of dispute, I believe. <laughs> Sam, why don't you go first, and I'll see if uh, it matches my... No, I like your version. I like your version better. All right. Well, uh, I had just moved back to Vancouver in 1984. And I, at that time, I was working at the North Shore Association for the Physically Handicapped, now the North Shore Disability Resource Center. And Sam was a student at SFU. And somehow we connected. He called. My recollection is it was about an accessible bus that maybe we should try out. And so I can't remember whether I went to SFU or they came all the way over to the North Shore. But we got on this bus in this compartment behind the back wheels, normally reserved for the luggage. And we we're completely on our own riding around town in this sort of isolated chamber on this bus. And I think that's that was our first get together. And then we started hanging out and chatting about life and disability and eventually music. And Sam came up with this idea because neither of us had much money. You know, hey, we should start a society. You know, raise some money, buy some equipment, and figure out a way to play music again. Is that close to the truth, sir? I like that one. That's a really good one. Yeah, no, I'll go with that one. Okay. Nice. You can talk about Dave the has a better memory than me, too. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe long term, not short term. You can tell the white spot story when we get to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's... And of course, the, yeah, the white spot story. And the Saigon. The, the which? The Saigon. Well, <laughs> also uh, the uh, the mall, our, our first performances. No, and that I'm definitely interested in hearing about yeah. that, for sure. So, so, in the first time you met, I know it's probably difficult, but did, um, <laughs> did you kind of connect right away over music? Like, was that a pretty natural or instant connection between the two of you? I think I really I don't know that it was music right away. It was, you know, we were both had very very similar injuries, and I was injured a bit uh, earlier in life than Sam, but uh, we had some common interests, and uh, you know, I think music just kind of came out of our conversation, and Sam was a more uh, I would say accomplished musician, and I remember him telling me about playing at the Commodore and oh, oh wow. uh, various things like that. And I was kind of just a, I played in bands in high school and grade school and uh, basically just, you know, started with piano, but turned to drums in my rebellious teenage years. And uh, uh, so I wanted to try to get back to piano, but I had tried that when I was in Ontario and there wasn't really any satisfactory way at the time to do that. And drums seemed to be a better option, although that was very frustrating until uh, I met Sam and eventually we partnered with Roland Canada. And it was just, you know, it was just the right timing, all these you know, digital instruments were coming out and sequencers and, you know, we had a number of options to look at and a lot of support. 
and then it kind of blossomed from there. Thank you. So you had the idea yeah, yeah. to create a society. What was originally the inspiration? Was it to raise money for instruments, or what was the original inspiration for VAMS? Well, I um, had created a nonprofit society to go ultralighting, uh, you know, to do ultralighting, uh, flying. Okay. And, uh, you know, played with that idea and it worked and we were able to raise some money and we had this ultralight and we used to go out and go flying. So I had that model and uh, I said, hey, maybe we could create a society and you know, try to raise some money and maybe there's some, some people who'd want to support us because we knew that uh, it was going to be hard. You know, like there was Dave tying drumsticks to his hands mm -hmm. and me, you know, sort of sitting over a keyboard. Uh, you know, what do I do with this? And, uh, you know, so uh, we didn't really have any way we were going to do this but we thought we need way more than just money we need people to come together and to try to brainstorm this and figure out how could we actually um, accomplish our goals of playing music and being expressive you know that I think that was the key thing that for both of us that the expression the ability to express yourself is probably no, there's no other, t no better or more need, greater need to be expressive than when you've got this traumatic disability and you're trying to find your way. And, uh, you know, that's the point where you really want to be, you know, able to express yourself. So that's what we did. We just sort of bumbled into it, uh, set up an organization and started trying things. Gotcha. No. So I had this process where I, I was I was gluing little knobs to my hands, tying them on at first, and then we were kind of gluing them on. And, you know, I would try getting different, you know, intervals okay. so that I could play more than one note at a time. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, you know, pretty much a waste of time. But I tried it and, uh, you know got a few little noises going out of it but then we needed to uh, try different things and then I think Dave that was you that discovered MIDI oh, okay I don't remember exactly but I I remember I actually still remember the first time when we were working at a Pearson at the time and uh, the first time I actually set up these octopads or I still use them today. They're just, you know, a little more advanced. And uh, in those days, they didn't have any internal sounds. You had to program everything with oh, a sound wow. source. And, <laughs> wow. and we used uh, some kind of MIDI sequencer for certain. I, I didn't really use any for the drums. Right. But I just remember the first time right. I kind of figured out that, hey, I could like play the bass drum and the snare with one hand. And I could, I could layer the bass drum with a crash cymbal so I don't have to hit two pads at the same time to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And I could keep the the tempo going on the hi-hat with my right hand, just basically was suddenly playing a beat. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, yeah. that's awesome. Like I, yeah. that this is uh, what this is what I'm talking about. And uh, right. I think when the sequencer well, there was a lot of steps along the way. Eventually, you probably want to talk about this, Sam, in terms of the the, uh, the mapping of the keyboard and how that, you know, working with Jeff Compton. Mm. There was a lot yeah, of different yeah, technology yeah. projects going on, and I don't remember how, you know, we connected all these people and how it all came together, but, uh, you know, we were collaborating with, Pearson as well because they had I don't remember the exact timing but they had a program called Supercussion and they were working yeah. mainly with residents there that 
had Deshane's muscular dystrophy. So they had these, you know, breath controls, little sticks in their mouth to tap something or whatever. And I think it was the Neil Squire Foundation. Amazing. You know, so they could trigger sequences or individual sounds or any, and it was an amazing, amazing thing. They had, I don't know, 12 or 15 people in that group. And we did a couple of shows with them. And so it was just a, a very energized kind of time. People were really buying into it. See, my recollection was that there was a wonderful older gentleman in Pearson uh, and he wanted to get a music program going, but he w- he was a great uh, lover of chamber music. Yeah. Do you remember his name, Dave? The uh, lovely guy. Uh, we've got to remember his name because he was so important to the whole thing. And so he set up this initiative in Pearson, and then he hired a guy who ended up going off to the prairies. And remember, uh, he, he used to work for supercussion for a while. I think he was the guy that brought MIDI into this. And then we met uh, the Roland, uh, Dave, come on, help me with all these names. Um, Barry, Barry Kramer. Barry, Barry Kramer, yeah, yeah, yeah. Critical guy. And he actually donated a whole bunch of Roland equipment. I'm not sure he was supposed to do that, but uh, he, he did. And uh, that's where you uh discovered the octopad and then uh, i so then what i was trying to do is figure out how to you know hit these uh keys with my uh, wrists and so what i did was i wrote uh, a, a letter and i actually had to draw it out because i had to write the keyboards and i drew the keyboards and I wrote to all, and I, I, I faxed it. Yeah, we didn't really have emails then. We didn't have emails then. Weird, eh? uh, I faxed it to uh, these music stores, and I said, you know, this is what I'd like. I'd like, you know, to do something, and I'd like this button to be pushed or this key to be pushed, and then the next one and the next one. And I kind of drew it out, what I wanted to do. And somebody got back to me and said, Oh, you would want to be in touch with a guy named Jeff Koftanoff in Grand Forks. Oh, okay. okay, sure. So I contacted him and I told him what we wanted to do. He said, Oh, yeah, I could do that. I said, Well, what? you know, and he said, Yeah, I could do that with a computer, you know, so he's a computer programmer. And so we had a computer called Dave, the Atari. Oh, the Atari. Oh. Remember we had an Atari? Yeah. I didn't until now. <laughs> and uh, okay. Anyways, we had this old Atari computer, uh, primitive thing, and Jeff wrote a program for me okay. to be able to press one key and get a whole chord happening. Gotcha. You know, and then another key down here and it would be a bass. And and he, he would even, you know, go in uh, time. I could sequence times. And so uh, what we did was every uh, every song I did, I would have to have a new program for it. So I would tell Jeff that I would want these black keys all to be certain notes so I could do one key after the other. And then some things I'd like to press a key and get a whole chord, you know. So uh, we were able to play real music. You know, it was limited, but we did it. Oh, that's very cool. And Dave, meanwhile, was in Supercussion, which was going really well. And then you discovered that band, incredible band that you guys played with. Oh, uh, you played too. That was Use Them. They use them. them. Oh, as my God. Them. Yeah. Well, I was already a fan oh. of them. So, uh, they they were also sponsored by Roland, so we did a couple of uh, Roland trade shows with them. Okay. And I think on the second one, we Supercussion was on that one, and we jammed at the end with Uzep. Nice. That was pretty awesome. It was amazing. Where were you guys playing? It was amazing. 
That was at the Plaza of Nations, as I recall. Was that for Expo? Yeah, it was in a... It was around that time, maybe okay. you know, probably a couple of years after Expo. Okay. But it was right in the... I thought it was well before. It was well... Oh, maybe no. I thought it was before. Okay, no. You're right. You're right. It was after. The reason I ask is because mm-hmm. my contact, well, my contact who used to work for Long McQuaid said that he did the live sound for you guys at that show. Really? At the, Mark Carpentier? Vaguely, actually, I remember that name. Yeah. Oh, and, no, no. He did, yeah. He, he was a little later. Okay. Uh, he did some other shows for us. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it was priceless. All these people we've run across. Yeah, no, it, it's just priceless. But, but, Dave, Dave, I think you forgot um, Bob. Uh, Bob. Uh, oh, not at all. Hey, help not, me, Dave. I just said there was also Don and, and, was involved somewhere in there. Who? Don, Don Hardy. Don? Oh, Don. yes, Don Hardy. Yeah, he was, I think he was quite active with Pearson. Okay. And yep. uh, he somehow got involved. And, um, but but uh, the, the one of the first concerts that uh, I know that we have an old video somewhere and it was in the mall in Brentwood mall. And uh, we have a video of it. And in the middle of the concert, this, uh, you know, uh, older woman uh, with her, um, you know, this son with a disability comes walking up and starts looking at the instruments and doesn't kind of realize there's a performance going on. And then in the middle of the performance, the big NW root bear comes bounding into the scene and doesn't realize there's a concert going on and has this whole thing that happens. And I thought, wow, you know, we're just like uh, that other band that we kind of named ourselves after Spinal Tap, yeah. uh, you know, because we named ourselves Spinal Cord and we were very similar to Spinal Tap in, in so many ways, you know, but remember when the scene where they said no we want it's not puppet show with spinal tap it's spinal tap with puppet show you know and so there we had a and w work root bear with uh spinal cord and oh, yeah, a little bears. mascot yeah i always remember i think yeah. we're in front of a shoe store or something and i just remember people walking yeah. by and kind of looking past us to look in the window <laughs> yeah they're trying to look at the shoes and that was before spinal cord i think it was just the two of us right because we did a few shows just with the two of us okay and uh but bob again timing is hard to i think bob came out of the meeting with jeff kopkinoff because somehow they knew each other right Right. and then bob yeah yeah and bob worked with us on writing and discipline you know and and uh, expressing ourselves he was he had this white chalkboard and i always remember this thing he wrote on the board saying there there are no mistakes just odd occurrences okay that was his thing you know he'd just like just go for it have fun Mm -hmm. i mean bob was unfortunately died a couple of years ago and he uh, was well known on Commercial Drive, uh, well known bass player, upright and electric and keyboardist, and did a lot of soundscape work and just very creative guy. I think we we're again very fortunate. Uh, we did a few recordings uh, with him that were kind of out there, you know, gotcha. they weren't really commercial. Mm pieces but they were and i i ran across what was the big song on that cassette that something about war of the children or you remember that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He was a passionate guy it you know? was, uh... i think it really helped us uh you know to i don't know just find a bit of a release in our music too that it was okay to to not follow some formulaic mm-hmm. uh standard experiment a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. i think that uh, yeah 
and, and that was pretty much our ritual. We would go then. Then we discovered other people like uh, Don Don Alder and uh, John John Shep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to be part of the band, you know, like first of all, we were going to have a band that was all disabled, and then we realized, oh, who's going to carry the gear? Oh, maybe we <laughs> maybe we should have a couple ABs, able-bodied yeah. people. We yeah. call them tabs, you know, temporarily <laughs> able-bodied. Uh, maybe we be, we should let them join the band too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So uh, we got pretty good musicians. Actually, they were fantastic, mm-hmm. and uh, so they came and joined and so what we would do is we'd go to Pearson and Pearson gave us a really nice space okay. and we could go there anytime we, we had our music musician or our instruments there and then we uh, would go and just start to jam mm-hmm. and get into these grooves okay. all night long kind of thing yeah we had our own a lot of fun. I mean there was a dedicated space for us and Mm-hmm. I think super percussion may have come in there once in a while, but uh, again, you know, you think every all these little pieces fell in place, and uh, not just by luck. I mean, I think there was reaching out, but it's just like it could have easily not happened. Mm-hmm. I think you know when I look back. Yeah. I mean, maybe the fact that it did means that it couldn't have not happened because yeah. <laughs> that's what happened. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I mean, we, it could have easily continued where uh, you would be having these drumsticks tied onto your hands, and I'd be with little sticks hanging out of my hands, and you know, we would make music. But uh, fortunately, all the technology came together, and all the people came together, and yeah. the space, and, you know, we raised money. Fortunately, uh, you know, we started, we, we called our band Spinal Cord. That's it. We were highly motivated too. I think that, I mean, because I was still working full time. I think you were either still going to school or doing all sorts of other side projects. You know, this was uh, this was a high priority in our in our lives. You know, and I think uh, yeah, it wasn't long before we realized how <laughs> much uh, you know of an impact it could have for other people. Mm-hmm. You know, once we got our act together, it's like, oh, there's a lot of people that could benefit from this. And, uh, you know, I think the fact that we figured some things out for ourselves and a few other people just motivated us all that much more, really. Okay. And so, I, you know, well, we wanted to kind of pioneer. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. but we used to, uh, so Dave became the founding president. And I think I was the secretary treasurer, and uh, we had no money. So uh, at that time, and eventually we started bringing in some money, and then we had to figure out how to do checks. And, you know, Dave had to sign, and, and I think we had, you know, two out of three signatures. So when we, when we needed checks signed, uh, we would meet in the uh, gas station, in the Chevron station. Was it on 4th Avenue, Dave? And uh, so we would get our vans. Yeah, we'd get, get our vans close to uh, each other. Oh, yeah, no, we'd go to the Wendy's and get a, a burger yeah. and then pull our vans up so we could each have our windows close. And we would chat, you know, as if we were you know, in a restaurant or something. And then at the end of it, you know, I'd pull out the checkbooks and I'd sort of, you know, uh, try to balance them on my wrists and and hopefully <laughs> I get the checkbook into Dave's van and he would sign several times. So the reason we did this in a, a busy uh, gas station was because we would often drop things in between. You know, I, I'd drop the checkbook and so then we'd have to, I'd have to drive up to the the service station and saying, would you mind, you know, going and picking up that checkbook and giving it to that good guy in the, in the other van. And so, you know, mm-hmm. and then sometimes and Dave would drop his pen and he'd have to, what's that? And would you mind being a board member? <laughs> <laughs> Third signature. <laughs> now, yeah, we, yeah. we, we did a lot of, 
you know, I just remember the Saigon restaurant, this Vietnamese restaurant on uh, Broadway near Oak. We used to go there a lot in the white spot. And just kind of brainstorm ideas and go over, you know, just different plans and mm -hmm. sign a lot of papers and yeah. figure out the, you know, mandates and directions and all that. But, uh, and play, you know, I, I don't know, to me, it seems like we would get together at least twice a week for a long time just to, to jam and, mm -hmm. you know, get things done. So, and that, was yeah. that at, yeah. I mean, the program started at Pearson, and then I believe it was 93 when the society moved to GF Strong? And is that when you moved to GF Strong, is that when you you were saying you were starting to see a lot more outreach and how the program was beneficial for other people? Yeah, I, I believe, well, that would be the time that I be, got into city council. So okay. I started losing my ability to, you know, have this flexible time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we created a studio and we wanted to, uh, you know, make this possible for other people to come in and i could never sort of figure out how to make it work uh, we, we hired uh you know a, a person to help with the studio and and uh tried to do outreach and you know we weren't very successful at first but it wasn't actually and well dave did a lot of work on it so when he started uh you know doing more work with other musicians and I didn't have the time, so I did a lot of the, you know, pr pretty much I, I didn't have as much talent as Dave either, so I just, uh, you know, uh, did the paperwork and made sure all the, uh, the, the forms were filed on time and all that stuff, and so I took more of an administrative role. Well, I actually moved to Victoria in 94, so I wasn't... Okay. I was accepted a secondment to go to Victoria initially just for one year, but I ended up staying for six years and seven years almost. And uh, so right. my recollection is we did one other show with Spinal Cord around 93. We did something in the studio, I think a live feed on TV, I can recall when we opened the studio and then for around that time and uh yeah. that was really the last time we played until the uh 25th anniversary oh wow we also uh played for kim campbell's homecoming when oh. she became prime minister okay um she uh you know, made some comment on the front page of the newspaper uh, when they were asking about herself because people really didn't know as much as, you know, they thought with the new prime minister from British Columbia. And, and she called the Spinal Cord her favorite band. So we got all these great interest. And unfortunately, we we weren't that good at the time. And so we, we had the great opportunity, but, you know, we didn't. We lacked the talent at that moment, and so we didn't have the, the things. But she, but she did come, and we uh, had uh, was it Jim Burns that uh, oh, who joined yeah. us. And, oh, wow. okay. We actually jammed a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, this was outside at the Plaza of Nations, and it was full of people. Okay. And uh, we got to play a play a set. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, we did a few big, bigger, we did a festival over in Nanaimo, I remember that Music BC or something, they had all these festivals going on, and okay. that was one of the times I actually forgot to bring my drumsticks, uh -huh. so we had to get duct tape and have somebody, so I, that's why I always <laughs> have drumsticks with me now, just in case. <laughs> that's literally, I think, why, but, and we did, uh, <laughs> Like a couple, I think we did a couple of telethons. Okay. Uh, with yeah, Spotify. yeah, Variety Club. Okay. Variety Club, and that's that'll show up on YouTube somewhere. 
think we did uh, Lady in White and We Only Kiss, probably. Yeah. Probably our two most. And, uh, and Rockstar. We did Rockstar. Do you guys remember? And then we also got... Pardon me? Oh, no, no, no. You go ahead. Well, we also... Um, uh, we did a rock video. Okay. You know, we found that there was some... I guess I was always trying to raise money for this thing, and so I found there was some some, some special program that you could get access to a, you know, some up and coming video producer. So I applied, and we won, and uh, so we did this little funny video that we're still embarrassed about, but uh, it's uh, is good that memories. merit? Ah yes. Okay. Don't don't don't. Yeah. Well, no. We what... tried to buy back and burn all of the copies, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of my <laughs> questions was, how did you guys? What was the initial idea for Mary? Like, what? How did you go about the idea for the music video? So uh, all of our music was was written by Dave. Was oh. well, Dave would uh, would write write lyrics, so he was constantly. Coming up with lyrics, Dave. Would you say? Well, the, I think the only the one that was really the song that I wrote was, you know, "Lady in White," yeah. which was something that happened way before. I think we were about fifty-fifty on the lyrics, and we co-wrote "Mary" because that actually happened in the way, in the recording process because we felt not of the video but of the CD. Mm -hmm. I remember we were in the studio figuring like these lyrics are not there's not enough. Okay. And so Sam came up with this idea with this sort of second backstory, you know, about the psychiatrist and the, yeah. uh, you know, that it's actually his wife that his client's having an affair with and all this. <laughs> it was crazy stuff, but it just kind of happened on the fly. I thought that was your idea. Oh. <laughs> blame me for that idea. No, I think we were all four of us were quite... Like, yeah, that would be a riot. That's a lot of fun. And uh, it just turned out, I think, at the time, you know, I mean, it's the first music video I've, I'd ever done, you know, and I think I've ever done, come to think of it, that was done in one day, as I recall. Oh, wow. Uh, was that a Rogers or something or Shaw Cable or something? <sighs> yeah, yeah, Shaw Cable. I think everybody in that, you know, were just friends and uh, people we knew that were just kind of did it on the fly. Gotcha. My favorite scene is when Sam, Sam sort of goes backwards out of the shot somehow. Right. And I remember there's somebody kind of ducking down behind him out of the camera shot and pulling him backwards. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. That's it is pretty corny, yeah. but it's uh, obviously has a lot of fond memories to it, you know, and sentimental and everything. But mm -hmm. We were just, you know, yeah. kind of had a lot of a lot of good energy. Around. The recording process for the CD was a bit more tricky for me, just given my work schedule and things. And I think mm -hmm. we did that at Blue Wave, I think, at... Uh, Tom Lavin's studio. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I found some grant somewhere that would help with, uh, you know, I think it was actually a Canada Council exploratory grant or something. And so they, uh, for a while, we had a little bit of money and we, uh, you know, hired, well, John Shep for a while and he, he helped. And then Dave Ritter came on board and he helped as well, sort of complete it. And uh, uh, yeah, we had, it was real music. Yeah. Yeah. And when was that recorded again? I don't know, 99. Just slightly after when A, slightly after when a w closed on Broadway. Uh, that's how I, I don't know years, I just know <laughs> restaurants. Gotcha. So. AMW keeps yeah. popping back up. That was we used to meet at the White yeah. Spot near Broad, uh, Broadway and McDonald too because okay. Bob Turner was living in this place just a couple of blocks behind it, so 
So we would meet, sometimes he'd join us. We'd have three vehicles lined up. <laughs> you know, we'd just, you know, chat through our windows, but, and then go over to Bob's to do <laughs> recording in, in the living room, basically. It was all just, okay. you know, kind of straight in digital recording, and then he'd do the vocals. Uh, I don't remember. I don't know if we did those separately or we just did it live. I can't recall. So yeah, we had a wonderful woman uh, from SFU who was a professor who also helped us. And okay. uh, uh, Dave, memory, go on, names. Doctor, uh, uh, gee, I could picture her too. Professor, she, doctor, yeah. Bob worked with her quite a bit too. Uh, oh well, sorry, that escapes me at the moment. We remember with fondness all of these wonderful people that helped us along. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because of our advancing age, we're just, uh, you know, uh, stuck on some names here, but uh, we do remember them fondly and, and are so grateful to them. I remember Dave and I went through that big list and almost everybody had had some tragedy before. Either they got fired or died or, you know, something at, awful happened to them and we somehow uh, survived it all and uh, all the other groups that were doing good work and started and uh, BAM somehow just kept motoring along and you know I think we focused on making sure we had financial support and you know kept the paperwork going and that kind of thing yeah it's I mean it's sobering humbling and Every, you know, I think of the, I usually reflect more on the supercussion in that respect, but, you know, they all had a very short life-term expectancy because they all, pretty much, I think all of them had Deshane's muscular dystrophy. Gotcha. There they were. They were having a blast. It was a great time. You know, everybody was just, you know, nothing but smiles, you know, making being creative, you know, being expressive, and, and you know, just knowing that they were amazing. Yeah. yeah. So remember yeah. that uh, guy I used to play the drums with his mouth, and uh, I remember he was also a stand-up comic or a sit-down comic, and uh, they would they would drag him up the stairs when they. Uh, uh, when, when the, when that place on, on Granville, uh, Dave, help me. What's that, uh, I thought it was yuck. dance place that they had No, Well, that, okay. Yuck, yuck. Yeah. Okay. So what they would do is they'd get him to the bottom of the, the stairs and then they would disconnect his respirator because yeah. he could only go up in a manual chair gotcha. and so he they would pull him up the, the stairs as quickly as they could because literally he was going to die you know if they couldn't get to the, the top of the stairs before they reconnect his respirator yeah, no, and so he would be kind of you know uh, gasping for breath get him to the top of stairs hook his respirator back in and then revive him again you know and then he would do this stand-up routine it's uh, just these heroes, you know, like, uh, oh, my God, you know, these guys are amazing. Yeah, well, and you think, and Graham, I know you've had this experience plenty of times where you have somebody come in the studio and maybe pokes their head in and they, they, they say, oh, I'm, I'm not a musician. I just wanted to see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you kind of got to like convince people that we're all musicians, you know, like you yeah. just have a standard maybe that is... Uh, unrealistic or something or you know it doesn't mean you can't have fun and be expressive and yeah. you know have a certain degree of talent that you know sometimes we're uh just by having a disability we're not overly encouraged maybe in those areas by society and whatever so i mean i'm always just find it amazing when people break through this barrier of you know, self-perception or mm -hmm. social isolation or whatever it is. And totally. that, that guy, I wish I could remember his name, and it's terrible when I can't, but 
when he'd go do these stand up, sit down comedy things, I mean, that was so far ahead of its time. <laughs> that was, this is a guy on basically on life support, getting people from here <laughs> to the hospital to go down there. You know, he'd need a team of people mm-hmm. and do his five minutes, you know, and, uh, you know, and then show up on time with, for super cash on the next day. You know, and they just, uh, <laughs> It was his yeah, passion, he was obviously. Inspiration. So, yeah. with yeah, when you start, when you both started Vams, did you think that it would have yeah. the reach that it does now? And I guess tying also into this, when did you both see that there was a larger need for the services that Vams provides? I would say. Well, that- I think we were very much. I didn't think we, I thought it was very much a personal thing. We wanted, we wanted to play music. Me and Dave met in a bus on the bottom, right beside these big wheels. And uh, we're thinking this is not a very good solution for uh, getting around, but uh, we didn't really want to insult the people because at least they were trying. Mm-hmm. And uh, we met each other and we discovered we both had musical, you know, uh, desires to you be able to play again and uh, work together and all. We didn't expect that at all, Dave. Mm-hmm. Did you? No, no, not in the least. I think gradually, you know, when we were exposed to other people like Supercussion, you know, just other people that we met along the way, it, it became more apparent that there is a larger need and, you know, uh, and you know when we felt how much joy we got out of it, I remember we we always say you know this is uh, it feels like when you're when we were jamming it was like we were playing you know like as kids like it was our really fun time you know what that's like Graham yeah. you ever you know it's just oh, fun yeah. it's just no you can't get enough of it not tied to anything you can just be free form and and having that experience. Uh, knowing that's possible is, I think it just drove the organization, but still we wouldn't know, you know, there's no way I would have expected it would still be going. Let's just, you know, yeah, so I think really what happened was I then got involved in city council mm-hmm. and was just so busy filling out forms and trying to raise money for things. Uh, and then, uh, Dave went off to Victoria, and here we have this vehicle, BAMS, uh, that that doesn't have any more musicians. And that's when we started looking for, uh, you know, we can't just shut it down. I mean, it's too much value in this. So we thought, well, we need to find another purpose. We need to. So uh, and at one level, we, uh, we became almost like a, a booking agent, you know, because we started discovering so many creative people that were doing music sometimes they were just singing in the shower but they were so good that we really encouraged them and we had a few events i remember one of that in that hotel out in burnaby there's a wonderful man who became a good supporter of us and he owned a hotel on kingsway in burnaby and uh so we had some shows in his place and then we got the studio, you know, the opportunity. I can't remember even how that happened. I think we had a good relationship with one of the therapists. Oh yeah, yeah. Do you do you have a remembrance of that, Dave? I have a remembrance, but I, I don't remember the exact details. But I think it was the one of the there was a bit of a relationship between Pearson and GF Strong. So we had some some help there. There was the executive director at Pearson was quite persuasive and very supportive of getting us space. And then Jan, I, th- I, th- I think her name was Jan. Uh, gosh, this is oh, yeah. so horrible yeah. that I don't have their names, you know, banners all over the place with their names on another person who helped us a lot uh, at GF Strong, responsible for therapies is it jan better do you remember jan better the record yeah yes yeah yeah i'm pretty sure and, and some other, another person so 
Um, anyways, they helped. Uh, yeah, I think we were getting shut out, shut down from Pearson. And then they thought, well, maybe they need to give us another, find another option. And, and so there was a space in GF Strong, and then we had to uh, really get in there and try to make sure we, because there's a lot of space wars that happened there. And so we were really lucky to get that space. And then we started putting equipment in it and bought, bought more and more equipment. And then... I uh, did that. And then, Dave, when you came back, then you took over the studio pretty well, or you helped to organize it? Yeah, a little bit. I think we had, I mean, at that, we also had a school program that was being run by uh, the, uh, Dawn, I think her name was. Okay. That would take uh, yeah. uh, just sort of uh, not digital instruments so much as just percussion and go around to various schools and just give kids an opportunity uh, to play. And we did a few shows for them as well. I remember, it, uh, I think it was out, at Sur out in Surrey, at one of the programs for children with disabilities out there. We do workshops. Mm, yeah. Just so mm. they could, you know, like take a stick and hit something and say, that yeah. makes a really interesting yeah. sound, you know, or and they could try different ways of accessing music mm -hmm. but um yeah it just it just had this evolution of uh of growth that eventually because i mean my time was quite limited i was playing in victoria but i and i was still on the board for vams but i wasn't we didn't have a vams chapter or anything in victoria so i was just right kind of doing my own thing and when I came back over occasionally we would get together but I was pretty time limited while I was there so mm -hmm. uh, and then since then when I came back to work at UBC it was especially when I stopped working at UBC I'm much more involved so. yeah. but I was seeing yeah, that was a very creative time yeah. yeah it was a very creative time and we were for a while, we were just flailing, trying to find something useful that we could contribute. You know, and I, it wasn't like the other programs that you know I was kind of running at the time: the the disabled sailing and the you know the uh, hiking program and Tetra and whatever. It it had a completely different uh, you know method. It was it was quite different than all the other groups, and so it was really struggling to find things. And so I'd get a grant for something and hire someone and they happen to be good at something. So I said, okay, why don't you do that? And we'll try it, you know? And, gotcha. and, uh, and I remember when I, uh, when I then accidentally became mayor and I had to leave all involvement with Vancouver Adaptive Music Society. And the, the big, the big worry that I had, well, the, you know, one me as one of the founders uh, leaves and uh, kind of worry that everything's going to fall apart, you know, when when you leave and no one's there to do all the paperwork and make sure all the books are kept and all the forms are filled in. And the other worry that I had was that it would get better, you know, and the, the Sullivan leaves and everything gets better. And, and I thought, wow, you know, uh, that would be also equally tragic for me personally. It would be a big blow to my ego and sure enough I left and things got better and uh, then a guy named Graham came along and really figured out how to make this thing work I'm still stunned that you've been able to do what you've done Graham so congratulations oh no thank you no, well, it, it all started with you two you know and actually well, sorry? But, that, but I think he could kind of understand that without you know it's been the right people at the right time and I think uh, uh you know, as long as you plan on retiring from this job, we're we're happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> but you got another thirty years. Yeah, put, put me on the spot here now. Yeah. <laughs> so again, touching on where we've come with the program, what are your thoughts on say the new studio renovation, the mobile studio, uh, the loan out program that we're doing, and even the uh, mini school that we're hoping to start up once the new studio is built and done. Let alone all the gigs and various things you're doing too. No, yeah, very true. Uh, 
uh, no, it's all very exciting to me. I, um, I know that the new studio has been sort of a slow process, but I'm excited that uh, we've got more space. You know, I think three or four times as much space in total square footage. So we're, I mean, I think that'll be awesome that we could have a live room and sort of control room or teaching room kind of idea and uh, have more types of instruments that people can try, maybe, you know, DJing and that kind of stuff. If people want to try out some of that gear. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and having that mobile, that's an awesome setup. Yeah. I mean, you're basically taking everything that's available to you in the studio, miniaturizing it, and, you know, it's sort of the idea of like when we were going to schools in the early days, but with a basket of tambourines, you know, this is, this is a much higher tech and, yeah. and not that acoustic instruments don't have their place in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they sure do. I mean, that's just, you know, we, they've been adapted too from trumpets to, uh, uh, guitar stands, mm -hmm. you know, all the rest of it. So drum sticks mm -hmm. so yeah no i'm 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 uh, encouraged and comforted by everything that's going on so the the um motto that i've always gone with is uh don't provide energy uh release energy hmm. so uh we are so thin in terms of finance and infrastructure and you know all of these things uh that uh you know it just i don't even know how these organizations maintain themselves i've never known how it happened all i know is you know every time every christmas when we do that dinner and we have these all these staff there i think who's paying for all these people like how does this thing work you know because you you will find that there is no other similar organization in any other city as oh. far as i know there's nothing similar to it no, because right. it, it shouldn't exist it it defies the law of gravity it doesn't actually there's no way that this thing could exist it, only by the sheer willpower of people involved and uh so uh you know I, I, it's a very odd uh thing as well because you know people love to music and they would love to create it and we cannot ever deliver a program that truly will satisfy all the creative needs of people but we are uh, a central focus and maybe even inspiration and a place for people to come together and to know that they're not alone that there are other people that have a lot of a probably hell of a lot more challenges than any one any one individual and they're doing it and so uh, it's always been a struggle to really figure out what is our role you know what how do we add value to society and for me it's uh the uh, there are so many uh, for every individual wants something different and you couldn't possibly match what they want but can have something that will inspire people give people an opportunity to get introduced to music. You know, Beethoven would certainly never have done what he did if he had to go into a studio to do, you know, his practicing or whatever. Of course. You know, uh, so uh, there's a limitation to what you could do with all of these things, but by providing some sort of uh, resources and a place to go and uh, people to talk to and somebody that actually cares about their musical and expressive capacity uh, is, I think, a wonderful contribution. And again, if you had a message, and Dave, you kind of touched on this earlier, but if you, if you um, were talking to someone that was a little hesitant about trying out an instrument or coming into the studio and just, you know, whether it's guitar, piano, drums, bass, even vocals, what what advice would you two give them? Uh, don't do it. 
having the disappointment in that in that road. Uh, no, of course. I mean, you know, I think the like I was saying, having this uh, community really of people that you can connect with and try things out and not, you know, I mean, you are, you know, I think in a way in your role and in my experience, being somewhat of a mentor or at least a facilitator, uh, an encourager, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't just sit and wait for them to, you, you've got to like, you're also a teacher, you know, you're providing resources and uh, connections for people. And hey, if this doesn't work, maybe, you know, you could try GarageBand or this, this keyboard online and you can just explore and you know don't really worry about outcomes so much but just mm -hmm. you know it's like for me i'll sometimes just play with garage band just as a creative outlet yeah. you know as an exploration tool mm -hmm. coming up with ideas so it's kind of like you hear the same thing with writing you know people say they're not a writer well you know try writing a haiku you know and uh, don't worry about you know that it's it's not master level we just have fun with it and mm -hmm. come up with you know there's different ways to approach any kind of craft mm -hmm. music painting writing you know whatever pottery you know it's i think it's just kind of trying to help people figure out why they're resistant to it there's a lot about judgment in there i still face that yeah. You know, I end up watching videos of Buddy Rich and go, well, I, I, hey, what am I doing? Oh, I shouldn't be in this field. I've been there. Back into the shed, yeah, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't really compare yourself on that level. I think just knowing that I'm, I have fun doing it is, and it's challenging. I mean, it's, you know, you got to accept there's going to be challenge mm -hmm. and persistence, you know, to maybe get where you feel you're comfortable with. Um, I think it's just having those kind of conversations, being open about, being open about it. And, uh, you know, if you can find a way for somebody to have fun first, yeah, to just enjoy what they're doing, that's that goes a long way. Totally. Yeah. Hmm. I think, like I was saying earlier, when Sam and I, I mean, I still remember the room. I can visualize it. I can. I can see Barry standing to my right and Sam by the door when I sort of figured out I could play a beat, that this was my thing. I had a lot of doubts before that, you know, so, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Huh. Well, that's gentlemen. beautiful. Yeah, well, I, yeah, that's uh, just to see that, Dave, I can't thank you enough for uh, being such a solid partner on this whole initiative and uh you know you are just uh, such a pleasure you know uh, it's often the uh, teamwork that you have people that aren't going to be dragging each other down but they're lifting each other up and so that's uh, dave thank you for uh, your leadership in that well thank you i mean you couldn't uh you know possibly imagine what life might have been like otherwise without that mm. pairing, without having met. You know, I'm pretty doubtful this would have happened if we hadn't met on that in that luggage container. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. it was, so yeah, and thank you for staying connected and supportive and, and even doing a reunion show. There's another yeah. one coming out, by the way. Oops. <laughs> Now, was that not fun? I remember when, when we were in the studio and you were practicing rock star and you were trying to get that vocal. That's one of my fondest memories of all time. Music. Oh, <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Yeah. It was excruciating for me. <laughs> uh, you, you, you killed it at the show. It was awesome. It worked. It, did, it worked. Yeah. Thank you, Graham, for all you do, and uh, thanks the Vancouver Adaptive Music Society for carrying on that, uh, that initial inspiration. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And, well, yeah. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to, you know, I've heard bits and pieces of the story here and there, but really a much more comprehensive look at, at everything that's going on. So no, again, thank you very much. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you. thank you, Graham. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. All right.